Okay, but first I have to have my, I know, I got another, I got another video. These are dads trying to tell jokes. Fathers, yeah. But there is one thing only they can do. Dad jokes. Coop sedan. <laughs> what do you call a laughing motorcycle? The <laughs> gum. Ground beef, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they call fish with two knees. It's toony fish. Toony fish. <laughs> Ray Cop just knocked on my door and told me that my dogs were chasing people on the bike. My dogs came into the bike. <laughs> 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 I tried to eat a claw the other day. It was really time consuming. <laughs> Who was the smallest person in the Bible? Me. <laughs> Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Hebrew is a pot of God. Wow, there. All right, so let's get into our text for the morning. I, I, I'm switching sermons because of Father's Day. The next, uh, to fo- the next text to follow, last week's sermon, would have been 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. But I am skipping that sermon. I actually have it all done. So Mickey preaches next week, and then I have the next week's sermon all done already. Uh, But I'm skipping that sermon, and we'll come back to that in two weeks. Mickey preaches next week. Because this text, 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 17, it uses the analogies of us being children to our Heavenly Father. So that was appropriate. So close to where I was preaching and close to Father's Day. So I'm not skipping anything. I've just switched a few verses around. This text is more appropriate or Father's Day. Okay, so let's look at the text. <coughs> First Peter chapter 1, verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Four verses. As obedient children, there it is, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. 
But as you, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, there it is, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Okay, there's our four verses that we're going to look at this morning. I hope you picked up. I have some nice, stiff cardstock out there. I have two main points. You're not going to fill those in, but you're going to fill in. I got three sub points under each one. So equivalent to a six-point sermon, I guess. First point, children, they obey their dad as obedient children. Secondly, uh, they don't look like the other families. And uh, thirdly, they look like their father. Second point, fathers, uh, our heavenly father, he is holy. He does not judge with partiality. And thirdly, he will bring us home. We are now in exile, and someday we will be brought home. All right, so let's jump into this. And I am making sure that I am conscious of the time with all of those father's videos. I'm getting a late start here. All right, first of all, children. The Bible uses the analogy of the family. We are part of the family of God. Um, it, calls every, it calls us brothers and sisters uh, in the Lord. It says we are adopted into God's family. The analogy of an adoption is an important um, in Scripture. We become his children Peter uses this analogy here. He says, as obedient children. So we are the children of God, and he sticks this uh, adjective on there. We are uh, obedient children. All right, here's a cross-reference about the family of God. 1 John 1, 12. You should know that one. Very well-known verse. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name... He gave the right to become, here it is, children of God. So there's a good cross-reference. That analogy is used throughout the Bible. Another cross-reference, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and here it is, members of of the household of God. Again, Paul, writing in Ephesians, uses that. that uh, we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and we are members of the household of God. All right, so my sub-point, point number one, they obey their dad. Just the very first few verses, Peter says, as obedient children. Huh? Obedient children. I have seen some who are not so obedient. Uh, uh, I know, I know, my brothers and I, when we were kids, we got plenty of spankings. I know, that was in the day and age when spankings were abundant. My dad had, we had a hanging up, uh, a spanking stick. It had a twine handle on it, and it got, it got plenty of uses. We learned to be obedient children because we didn't like getting those spankings. I say here, obedient in the Greek, kind of an interesting word, hypakoa, hypakuo, here we are, hypakuo. Um, the first part of it, akuo, means to hear. We have the English word acoustics, right? You've heard of that. Talking about here, acoustics in the building are, well, how well do people hear in various corners of the auditorium? So it comes from the Greek word akuo, and then the prefix on the front of that is hypo. They have two word, interesting prefixes. They have hyper, which means over, you know, a hyperactive child. And then they have another one very similar to it, Hypo, which means to be under, to be beneath. A hypodermic needle goes underneath the dermis, the skin. So this word, hypoacuo, 
uh, literally means to hear and then place yourself under what you have heard. You see the word obedient in that. Literally, going beneath what is heard. Obedience as the response to someone speaking. Uh, this refers both to an earthly voice, but in our case, refers to the voice of the Lord. We are to be obedient to children. We hear God's voice, we hear his word, and we place ourselves underneath his authority and obey what he says. Cross-reference in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 3 says, Children, oh, oh, they all went downstairs. We should, I should have shown this one before they went downstairs. Right after this, though, he addresses uh -uh, fathers right after this. But here, Paul in chapter 6 of Ephesians says, Children, obey, there's our word, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he quotes from one of the Ten Commandments. He says, Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. That's the promise that he gave to the Israelites if their children would honor their father and mother. Um, so here we have a cross-reference. Literal children are to obey their parents. We as the children of God are to obey God. You know, sometimes there's just that rebellious streak in us we know what the Bible says about things. We know, that, we know that we should do it, but we just don't want to. We need to learn how to be obedient to God. <clears throat> Point number two, they don't look like other families. Peter says to them, the second part of verse 14, he says, do not be conformed to the passions of your family. Former ignorance. Now, former ignorance, he's referring to before they got saved. Before Jesus Christ entered their life and changed them and transformed them, they were living according to the passions of uh, whatever they wanted to do. Um, Paul says, do, or Peter says here, do not be conformed to that. Uh, some comments. This refers to the kind of life they used to live before they were saved. Once a person comes to Jesus Christ, their life should change. It's an evidence of their salvation that they have a changed life. Sin will begin to disappear, and holiness and obedience to God will begin to grow in this person's life. The Greek word for conform. He says, do not conform. Kind of interesting. Uh, here we go. Here's, here's the Greek word. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Sis exmatismo. Tiz, tiz, tizzo. Yeah. Sis exmatismo. Um, the first part, soon, means to identify with together. Uh, Jews, we meet in a church. They meet in a synagogue, that prefix is on the front of that, means to gather together. Uh, and then zexmiztidzo, I didn't pronounce that right, but having the outward shape. So properly, it means to be assuming a similar outward form by following the same pattern, a model, a mold. My grandkids like to come over, and Laurel picked it up on a garage sale. She picked up this Play-Doh set, and it has a whole bunch of different colors of Play-Doh. Of course, the kids get all of the colors all mixed together as they play with it. But it has a little spot that you put a lump of Play-Doh, and then you got this handle that you pull down on it, and it squeezes and shapes that Play-Doh into a certain form and you can change the form some you can put a star in there you can put a square in there you can put a circle in there and it squeezes the play-doh uh, into that shape well that's kind of an explanation of this word the world wants us to be squeezed into its mold to follow the same kinds of patterns that worldly people are conformed to but 
we are not to do that. A good cross-reference for the... Oh, here's a, this isn't the one I was thinking of, but here's another cross-reference. Ephesians 2, 1, through and, 1, 2, and 3. Paul says, this is talking about their, their former life. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That is Paul's description of what we were like before we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and he began to change us. We were dead in our sins. We followed the prince of the power of the air. We followed our passions of the flesh. Kind of a, kind of a uh, what do I say, depressing description of what it was like. People need to come to know Jesus Christ, because this is like the rest of mankind. This is what the whole unsaved world is like spiritually. Another cross-reference. Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2. Do not be conformed. There's that same word that Peter used to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds that by testing you by, by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul contrasts the two words. Don't be conformed, don't let the world push you into its shape, but be transformed from the inside by the work of God in your life. Okay, point number three under there. C, they look like their father. They don't look like the neighboring families anymore because they've been changed. They've been brought into the family of God. I've always thought it was interesting. We've had people who don't know that Eugene was adopted. They often say, oh, Eugene looks a lot like you. You know, they think, they, does he, do you look a lot like your dad, Eugene? Oh, do you? Uh, he at one time had a different father, but was adopted into our family. That's the way we have been. They look like their father. Verse 15, Peter writes this. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. We are to be holy in our conduct, in our lifestyle. Comments. <clears throat> Just as a child may look a lot like his dad, we are to practice the same characteristics that our Heavenly Father has. We are to be holy because God is holy. The root meaning of the word holy is to be separated. Holiness means to be separated from sin and set sin aside and live clean lives. That's what it means, that we should be holy, separated from sin and li living clean lives for the Lord. Cross-reference, 1 Peter chapter 2, going to be coming up. Uh, and Paul, ha I could have included a bunch of Paul's lists. They often have lists, long lists of sins that I think were common and were ones that Christians need to battle against. Here's Peter's list. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, So put away, put them out of your life, don't have them in your life, all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. None of those things should be in our lives. Let's define them. i got to watch my time here, but we can define them. What does the word slander mean? Last one, slander. When you get to talking about somebody and you put them down and criticize them. How about that first one, malice? Malice is when you hope bad things happen to somebody else. You know, somebody you don't like, you hear they 
had a car accident or you hear they've gone bankrupt or something and you say, good, I'm glad it happened to them. You know, <laughs> that is what malice is. Well, we are to put malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy. Envy is looking at others and saying, boy, I wish I was like them. Boy, God, I wish you had made me just like them and given me all that you've given them. I'm dissatisfied with the way you have made me and what you have given me. That's what envy is. We're to put those away out of our lives. All right, point number two. Father. God is seen as the Father. Huh? Just like we have earthly fathers, we also have a heavenly Father. <coughs> I have heard somebody say, the most influential person in a child's life as he grows up is the father and he'll be watching his dad and he'll be he'll see exactly how his dad lives and he'll see the way his dad acts and that influences a child more than any other person in the entire world we need to pattern ourselves after our heavenly father that we have received Peter uses the, the title, that title here for, for God. Peter uses that title of God here. He calls him Father. He calls him our Father. All right, cross-reference. Matthew 6. Oh, Matthew 6. Jesus' disciples are asking him how they should pray. <coughs> and Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven May your name be holy. Hallowed be your name. Huh? That prayer, we call it the Lord's Prayer. Uh, starts off, our Father which art in heaven. A couple verses later, verse 14, it says, And if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So in Scripture, he is regularly called our Father. It's interesting. Jesus when he was on earth, always called him his father, except there was one time when Jesus did not call him father. That's when he was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isn't that interesting? All right, going on. He is holy. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Just like a child patterns themselves after their dad, we are to pattern ourselves after our heavenly dad, our heavenly father. You shall be holy because God said, I am holy. Um, he, we are to live holy lives because our heavenly father is holy. Peter quotes, what Peter is quoting here is from Leviticus chapter 11, Verse 45, for I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And Peter took that over into the New Testament. Here it is applied to Israel. Peter applies it to the Gentiles as well who were coming into, who were now coming into the family of God. Therefore be holy for I am holy. A characteristic of God is that he is holy. Cross-reference. Then he said, Exodus chapter 3, yeah, this is an interesting story. L let me just recount a little bit of Moses. Moses grew up in the palace of Pharaoh, rich and, and powerful. And then he killed an Egyptian because that Egyptian was beating a Hebrew. And Moses had to flee. And Moses fled out into the wilderness, it is called in scripture, and he got a job uh, by his father-in-law. He probably got the job first and then kind of like the daughter of his boss, and they eventually got married, you know. Um, and he was tending the sheep out in the wilderness. And one day he saw this bush burning. Now I have read that sometimes, because it is so dry and so hot and these bushes when they die they can get dry and and they can they can spontaneously combust but what's unique about this bush was that it didn't burn out 
It burned and burned and burned, and Moses is sitting there watching that. And Moses went over there to see what was going on as, and, as he approached the bush. A voice out of the bush said, then he said, Do not come near. Take the sandals off of your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. The Father is holy, and because his presence was there in that bush, that whole ground around that bush became special, became separated from worldliness. It became holy ground. Back at uh, Remedy Church, I don't know if you remember this, Mickey and Mary, that uh, Dylan, when we first hired him, he had a peculiar practice. He would take his shoes off. He was a, we hired him as a, as a song leader. He played guitar and stuff, and, but he would take his shoes off when he came up on the platform. He says, well, it's because it's holy ground. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. All right, number B, he does not judge with partiality. Verse 17a says, and if, you are, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. He judges, isn't that interesting? Peter thought, when he thought of God as father, he stuck this description in there of him who judges impartially. Uh, here, <laughs> I know, I've come up with some good ones for you today. If you thought that or whatever that other Greek word was, here's another one. Aprosopolemptos, there. I didn't even go into all of the words that are stuck together in the Greek language to, to make up this word but it means not accepting the person. Now, we might think that's bad, but it was meant in a good sense. It meant without respect of persons. It was very, very, very common, both throughout the Old Testament and even especially in the New Testament, that when a judge had to rule on a case, the person who wanted the judge to rule in his favor would come and give the judge a bribe. And then it didn't matter to the judge who was right and who was wrong. He wasn't judging impartially. He would judge according to the person who gave him more money. Yeah, uh, that was meant that they had respective persons. The person who was, a, who was the wealthiest, who had the most prestige, they would usually be judged. And all the common people knew that the judges were corrupt and that they judged with respect of persons. If they went to court against a wealthy, influential person, they knew they would probably lose, even though they were in the right. God is not that kind of judge. God judges fairly and impartially and without respect of persons. The adverb from a compound, the alpha on the front of it, and then a compound, I, w I didn't even go into what these two words meant. It means not accepting the person, i.e. it means to be impartial when you are making judgments. Comment here. God our Father is declared to have the character of impartiality. Father does not have favorites. Fathers are not to have favorites among their children. Any of you ever watch that uh, Tim Allen show? What's the new one? Um, Last, man Last Man Standing. Yeah. He had two girls who were older, and they were really girly girls. In fact, the first one got pregnant without, before she had graduated from high school. But the last one was really into sports and things that he really liked. And so on the show, he always talks about how she, a father isn't to have favorites, but she's really his favorite on that, on that show. I, I like that. Well, a father is not to have favorites among their children. <coughs> um, Anyone who comes to Jesus Christ in faith will be accepted. Isn't that wonderful? It doesn't matter what you did. What did I say here? I say the kind, gracious person or the lust-filled cheat, both are accepted in Christ by the Father. Because the Father don't judge what we are doing, what we have done in the past. It's Jesus' righteousness that is placed on us. All right, last point, he will bring us home. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. 
I know, I really got into the Greek here, but I want to look up that word exile. Greek word for exile. Para, paroikia. It means to sojourn. Be in an exile in a strange land, to have a foreign residence. Again, you can take it apart. The prefix para, it means to be close beside. The Holy Spirit is our paraclete, parakletos, called alongside. Um, and then the word oikos, which means house. So it means to be living, um, how do I say it? Hence, to dwell close to someone else, meaning in a strange land. We as believers living in this world are living in a strange land and someday God will take us home. When I first graduated from seminary, uh, we moved down to Florida. I got a, a, a position as an associate pastor in a church down in South Florida. But whenever it became vacation time, we could have vacationed anywhere in the world. We could have gone to real, well, I don't know if we could have. Some things are real expensive, but we could have driven wherever. But for all the way from South Florida, uh, we would drive up to a little town in Grand Rapids called Allendale. That's where I grew up. Why? Because our home was there. Somebody might say, somebody else might say, why, when you got vacation time, would you drive to a little town in West Michigan, uh, you know, called Allendale? Well, it was because that's where our home is. We are going to be taken home someday to be with the Lord. We're living in exile right now, and we will be taken home. So while we are on this earth, we are to live in exile because our real home is in heaven with our heavenly Father. Cross-reference, Philippians chapter 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that em enables him even to subject all things to himself. Verse 20 there, our citizenship is in heaven. All right, here's the conclusion. We are to be obedient children to our Heavenly Father. He is holy, so we are to be holy. We are to put sin aside and obey the commands that Scripture has given and live holy lives. We are only foreigners here on this earth and this life. He will someday, we will someday go home to dwell with our true Father in our true home in heaven. Nice passage from 1 Peter. Let's stand as we sing our concluding song.